Well, thank you to everyone, the dear colleagues, dear friends. It's so good to see you again all uh, together here in Paris. My name is Javier Scanet, and it is a pleasure to uh, introduce this session on tailored support for complex PCI and acute myocardial infarction with percutaneous mechanical circulatory support. I think it's a very interesting topic, obviously the reason that you are uh, here today with us. These are my conflicts of interest. And without further ado, I would like to go to the cath lab. This is what we do every day in our cath labs. And I'm sure that many of you had already experience of using uh, mechanical support um, in, in your cath labs in cases like the one that we are uh, performing. Uh, why is it important to discuss this particular tool? Because still, the room for use for usage uh, is improving and is uh, expanding a lot we have new indications for use of mechanical support uh, we have the possibility of applying this in new subsets and particularly perhaps having the possibility of using this to improve the outcomes of patients like patients with acute myocardial infarction in which we have reached a sort of plateau in our therapeutic success so for this uh, reason the session, the objectives that we set ourselves for these sessions were to learn how standard operating procedures, including mechanical circulatory support, improve outcomes in patients with uh, complex uh, features, to discuss new strategies to overcome ischemic reperfusion injury associated to myocardial infarction using percutaneous uh, mechanical circulatory support, and to understand the benefits of mechanical circulatory support, mechanical support, circulatory support in patients with acute myocardial infarction. We have uh, with us um, two distinguished colleagues who are experts in this topic, and they are going to be elaborating. The first one is uh, Norman Manger, who is going to speak about um, how a standard operating procedure for complex coronary lesions with percutaneous mechanical circulatory support leads to superior patient long-term outcomes. And addressing the third uh, objective, we will have um, Florine Kukuli speaking about how to prevent ischemic reperfusion injury in acute myocardial infarction with percutaneous mechanical circulatory support. We encourage you to participate, to engage. In the room, we have colleagues who have ample experience in the use of uh, mechanical circulatory support. Uh, so please join the conversation, uh, bring questions, bring comments, because this will make uh, the session much richer. And without further ado, uh, Norman, if you would like to introduce your talk. Thank you. Yes, dear colleagues and friends, uh, it's fantastic to see a room like this with people standing on the side, but there are also still some free chairs in the front line, so if you want to come to the front, then you can have a seat. But I'm really happy to present uh, this talk with a, a quite long title. Um, I want to talk about essentially about two facts, and one fact is um, how does um, mechanical circulatory support can help us to treat complex coronary artery disease. And the question is, if this is already a standard um, operating procedure, and if so, if there are any specific aspects within um, the mechanical circulatory supported uh, high-risk PCI that can be defined as a standard operating procedure. So these are my conflicts of interest. When we talk about complex and high-risk PCI, uh, we are aware that we face patients who present with severe comorbidities like diabetes, renal dysfunction, cabbage ineligibility, maybe cardiogenic shock or accompanying um, valvular heart disease. And those patients often have um, definitions of complex coronary artery disease, which might include multivessel disease, left main disease, bifurcations, heavily calcified lesions, and I think we are all aware that those patients' numbers are increasing uh, when we look in our, into our daily business in the cath lab. And clear is also for the, that the treatment for those patients is not just PCI with a balloon and a stand, but the equipment to treat those patients is quite complex. It might include intracoronary uh, physiology and intracoronary imaging. It might include atherectomy to treat calcified lesions and so on and so on. And often those patients present to us with a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. They come commonly hypotensive and they represent uh, high left ventricular uh, filling pressures. 
And the question is now, can patients be better treated in such a situation when a mechanical circulatory support system is implanted during such a high-risk procedure? And mechanical circulatory support devices, uh, this is nowadays a broad landscape uh, with different devices coming with different, um, with different strategies to support the heart and the hemodynamics. And what we want to talk about today in particular is the impeller device, which is an axial flow continuous pump. Um, and in its latest version, uh, impeller CP, it can be implanted percutaneously via a 14 French sheath and is able to um, help us with uh, cardiac output up to four liters per minute. So what data do we have on this device? And I come up with some data uh, which are already 10 years old uh, nowadays. And this was a PROTECT 2 trial, which randomized nearly 450 patients in the setting of a high-risk PCI to um, PCI under impeller 2.5 support versus IABP. And in a secondary analysis with the endpoint death, stroke, MI, or revascularization, uh, it was able to show that patients treated under impeller support had a better outcome compared to the patients treated under IABP support. And this was true in the per pot protocol population, but it was also true in the intention, intention to treat population. And what is of utmost importance when we look at these Kaplan-Meier curves is that we see that patients do not differ during the first days uh, for the MACE endpoint, but the um, curves diverge after day 30, in particular up to day 90. And this might be the hypothesis why a mechanical circulatory supported um, high-risk PCI may lead to a better long-term outcome. More contemporary data come from the PROTECT-3 trial, um, which is a post-approval um, registry and included more than 1,000 patients. And out of those 1,000 patients, uh, about 500 were P2-like. They would have been eligible to be included in the P, uh, protected, uh, PROTECT-2 trial, and that's why they are called P2-like P3 patients. Yeah, a little bit difficult, but I think uh, it is clear for everybody what this means. Of course, there are some differences with regard to the baseline characteristics, but I want to point out that um, those P2-like P3 patients had more multivessel and left main disease they had more severe calcification and there was a greater use of atherectomy, a higher rate of complete revascularization, and there was a longer support uh, with the impeller device, which was in two-thirds of the patient's uh, impeller CP device, in contrast to impeller 2.5 in um, P2 uh, for 100% of the patients. And if we take a look at the 90-day MACE rate, which uh, consisted, uh, again, um, um, out of death, stroke, MI, and repeat vascularization, you can see that those patients treated in um, PROTECT-3 had better in-hospital outcomes, um, and there was also improved midterm outcome when we, uh, when we analyzed those data in a three-day landmark analysis in a propensity-matched cohort. And now the question is, what were the main drivers, in particular, for the improved in-hospital outcomes in those patients? Um, for the primary endpoint, you can see that this was mainly driven by a lower rate of um, myocardial infarction um, and a tendency to, to a lower death rate. But I want to point out in particular that there was also a lower rate of complications during the intervention itself. And there are three points which are quite important and which might explain why there had been a better midterm outcome in those patients. We uh, saw reduced bleeding, and bleeding is uh, something which is really important uh, during the use of MCS because it can kill our patients in the, late, uh, in the later time. We had uh, less hypotensive um, episodes during support, and we had lower rates of CPR and ventricular arrhythmia during the treatment of those patients, which might have an, uh, which might have an influence on the improved um, midterm outcomes in those patients. And we are also aware, of course, that an MCS is not just only or might not only be a positive thing. It might come with, with uh, complications and with harm. Um, these are data um, uh, derived from health insurance data. So this was ICD coded. We can discuss about the quality of those data. But at least there seems to be a signal that MCS 
can also potentially harm the patient, uh, which has been shown in this analysis by Amin et al. Uh, in circulation two years ago. And that's why we really have to um, uh, we really have to organize such a high-risk PCI supported by MCS as a standard operating procedures to prevent complications. And the PROTECT-4 trial is now the trial which is made to define the role of MCS in high-risk uh, PCI. Um, these are patients um, having ischemic cardiomyopathy with a left ventricular ejection of 40 or below. They present with chronic coronary syndromes and STEMI, or in specific situations also with a STEMI. And they are randomized to a PCI plus impeller CP versus a PCI without any support, which will be the main focus in Europe, I think, but also uh, in the um, US sites um, uh, with an IABP in the control arm. This will be stratified, of course, during randomization, so that uh, this is uh, randomized again. It will also be stratified by the ejection fraction below uh, 25 or above. And um, there will also be an accompanying registry, which will include about 1,000 patients um, who fulfill the inclusion criteria, but who have at least one exclusion criteria, so that we can really figure out if this patient um, included in the randomized control trial is um, is the one we really want to have and we really want to see in our daily business. When it comes to the primary endpoint, it's important that we do not look in this trial for, a contemporary, uh, for, for a acute outcomes. We look for long-term outcomes and the primary endpoint consists of all-cause death, stroke, durable Elvert implant or heart transplantation, MI, or hosp hospitalization for cardiovascular causes at three years of follow-up with uh, a minimum of one year in every patient. And this study is uh, currently enrolling patients and many sites in the US and in Europe have already been activated and uh, are very active in including patients. And we are really eager to see um, the recruitment fulfilled and the uh, results of this trial. So what, what are some standard operating procedures within this trial, which might be important during um, our daily clinical routine? And I think, and I already mentioned one one important thing is that bleeding and exercise management is of utmost importance and the avoidance of any complications in this field um, is uh, necessary. That's why micropuncture is highly recommended in the trial and uh, puncture has to be done under ultrasound and fluoroscopy um, control. A pre-closure with a proclide system is used. You have to use um, the stiff wire for sheath insertion. You have a very strict rule for ACT control, not to overdose or underdose um, the heparin during the intervention. And the use of 2B3A inhibitors is discouraged, uh, at least if it is not a bailout situation. And uh, the most of us are due to uh, a highly active tower business are used to those um, exercise managements, but uh, this might be not uh, the case if you are not used to deal every day with large bore access. On the other hand, there is of course a recommendation for the best practice of PCI, uh, which includes the use of intravascular imaging and intracoronary physiology, and there is a clear recommendation for state-of-the-art calcium treatment with a high rate of atherectomy, state-of-the-art bifurcation and CTO treatment, and the use of embolic protection devices if it comes to the uh, PCI in um, the venous venous crafts. There will be also a right heart catheterization sub-study, which will address the utility of the right heart cath in CHIP patients. Um, there are several me measurements uh, during the intervention, and hopefully this sub-study will help us to inform us about weaning criteria from the MCS um, uh, at the end of the procedure, if it needs to uh, be longer in the patients, if it can be taken out safely uh, directly after com uh, completion of the PCI. Uh, so these data will be of, uh, of great value. And last but not least, there will be a viability sub-study uh, which helps us to inform about the impact of viability in CHIP and if this should become an SOP, so if we should really treat um, arteries supplying a, a, a non-viable area or if we should do so. And um, this is also a very um, big interest in the study to figure out those um, data. So 
let me please summarize. The hemodynamic support um, with an MCS has been shown in the latest times that reduced procedural complications lead to improved early outcomes. It enables optimal lesion selection and stent implantation and a more complete revascularization, which might be the key for improved late outcomes. And um, with state-of-the-art um, um, PCI techniques, it is possible to reduce restenosis, stent thrombosis, and to improve LV function, which is a key for a reduced MACE rate during uh, longer-term follow-up. And PROTECT4 is a trial uh, which is designed to demonstrate that in CHIP patients, PCI with the Impella MCS is superior to PCI without Impella MCS in reducing the composite rate of the primary endpoint already mentioned before at a follow-up of three years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Norman, for this uh, great presentation. Again, remember that we have uh, microphones where you can, that you can use to put uh, questions and comments. Uh, we strongly encourage you to do that because that will uh, contribute to the success of the meeting. In the meantime, Norman, <coughs> something that I, is, I, is, I always you know, um, like very much seeing the kaplan meier curves uh, both in, in the PROTECT2 and PROTECT3 trials, showing that the benefit is not only immediate. In PROTECT3, you have a demonstration that there is a periprocedural sort of improvement of patients, but it also extends in the long term. Can you elaborate where this long-term benefit comes from? Do you think that is because you achieve a much better degree of revascularization in these patients? Has it been looked into that? Or do you think that perhaps there is a protection on other vital organs? I'm thinking, for example, in the kidney. I mean, many of these patients uh, have um, some degree of um, renal function impairment, um, and perhaps is, there is something over there. Can you, can you elaborate a bit on this? Yes. So I think there are several hypotheses why it uh, leads to such an improved midterm or late-term outcome. I think one fact, of course, is a more complete revascularization because it has been clearly shown that a more complete revascularization leads to a, leads to a better improvement in LV ejection fraction in ischemic cardiomyopathy. And uh, some weeks ago, there was a very nice study in the circulation cardiovascular intervention showing some veterans data um, where a larger improvement in um, ejection fraction was associated with a better long-term outcome. And this was not only for one or two years, this was above uh, a time period um, of uh, 10 years. And I think this is one fact which, which is really important, and we have those data from other trials, from Noble, from Syntax, and so on. When uh, complete revascularization was achieved, um, either by PCI or by cabbage, the outcome was better for those patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And right. of course, um, other protect or the protection of other organs might also play a role because we know acute kidney injury during any intervention, if it is for the coronaries, for the tarver, or anything else, this might have an impact on uh, at least one year, two year mortality in those patients. And I think um, if we can pr protect not only the heart, but um, also the other organs by an MCS, it has the potential to improve the late outcomes. So in other words, if you do PCI in a complex high-risk patient, you have to do it well. And that means you have to use all the palette of resources we have, uh, plaque modification techniques, uh, ability to tackle chronic total occlusions, and you really need proper support to do this safely. Uh, yes. and also to circumvent any problem that may happen in, in the meantime. So it is, in a way, it is, it's, a, it's a synergy between all the developments we are having in addressing the different problems of these patients uh, together with the intention of really achieving a, a, a new kind of, uh, of state-of-art PCI. Florian, any, any comments on these uh, topics? Um, I, th I think very good comments from your side. Um, in my opinion, it's quite important that the things we do... So, if you think, if there's one factor we can influence and give the patient with him so he has a good outcome, then it's lumen. When we implant stents or even when we use draco to balloons. If he has no lumen, he will have a bad outcome. In order to achieve lumen in a patient who is, let's say, ejection half of 20, uh, LVDP of 26, and a proximal LAD, which is highly calcified, you need time. Because, as you said, you would need to need different modalities to, to modify this plaque and to achieve lumen. You would use, uh, you know, imagine using, uh, using shockwave in such a patient. Um, he, will, he will deteriorate immediately. 
if you do such cases, you inflate one balloon, the second, the third one, and then you will start, the patient gets worse, you, you start noradrenaline, and you have the urge to finish the case. So you leave this patient who actually needs this really big LED with big lumen to have a big, good outcome, you leave him with the underexpanded stent. So I think one of the things which I have uh, learned from this using mechanical support in such cases is I have the time and the relaxed environment to create lumen for the patient because I believe lumen is is um, maybe in such situations maybe 70 percent of the outcome so let's uh, let's ask the colleagues um, to, to raise the hand how many of you had already experience with impella in the in the audience can you raise your hands okay that's good so you know what we could do normal is uh, for for people that are getting initiated in the technique what are the key aspects of making a safe puncture? If start by patient selection or access selection. What would you recommend to make a proper uh, assessment of, of, of vascular access? And then the, mm, the, set, the basic set of rules to make it safe and to make it uh, successful. Yeah. I think most of those patients, at least um, which were covered by my talk, are semi-elective to elective. And first, uh, or in some of those cases, those patients are also referred from other hospitals to you as an expert center, maybe. And it is advisable that during such a diagnostic coronary angiography that you also, also perform just a one shot into the, um, into the iliac arteries to really figure out if it would be possible to, to put in an MCS, to put in an impeller. If this is not possible, you can also use, of course, CT, CT angiography. But often those patients are uh, coming together with renal uh, failure or renal insufficiency, and that's why it might be harmful to do too many shots of contrast dye during day one, day two, day three. And um, I, I'm a, f a big fan of ultrasound, not only for the puncture, but also for the diagnostics of the vessels before. And this can be done in at least most of the patients. Of course, you are often not able to look into the aortic bifurcation, but you are able to look at the um, f um, um, common femoral artery and uh, into the distal iliac um, externa. And um, this is uh, uh, something which you should um, really do um, when you puncture for a large axis, use ultrasound and maybe use it together with fluoroscopy. So use a micropuncture set, put just in a very small four French dilator. You can easily give some contrast. This is not much, two, three, four cc. And you can see if you are in the right place, not above the um, inferior epigastrica or too low, that will, everything will produce problems with uh, retroperitoneal hematoma or pseudoaneurysm. And um, this, is, this is my biggest advice. And then do the puncture really at 12 o'clock. Use your ultrasound probe and then puncture the anterior wall of the artery because this will result in the best, um, in the best closure techniques afterwards. I'm not a friend to use proclite in the 10 and 2 o'clock position, but if I have punctured at 12 o'clock really with my needle, it's, it's quite easy to also put in the proclite at 12 o'clock, and then I just have to use one proclite, and this will uh, end up in a good result, and the vessel will not be twisted or anything else um, uh, when you do those approaches with turning around the, the proclites. And um, afterwards, it's, it, it is advisable to check if there is any bleeding, as we do maybe in Tavers. This might be difficult in the setting of the MCS because we often use single access strategies, which means that we use the 14 French cheese for the impeller, but also for the um, guiding catheter in the same place, which is a good idea. But if you cannot do an angio afterwards, then just use your ultrasound probe in the end and have a short look on it, on the vessel, how, how it looks like, if there's severe stenosis, if there's any color flow coming out. And um, this, uh, in the end, could be a good uh, option to rule out that there is bleeding, um, and which occurs maybe a little bit later on the ICU. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Norman. Thank you. <laughs> and and we move now to, um, um, to a really an, an outlook on the use of um, a me mechanical circulatory support, which is um, the patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction, myocardial infarction in general. So Florin is going to bring to us an outlook on the current research and evidence uh, showing the potential benefits of this uh, technique in these patients. 
Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you um, for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, you can imagine it's it's basically the two, tr the two trials we are we are presenting here. One trial is the um, Protect for, and the other one is the STEMI DTU. But um, I will have actually uh, two cases and try to to connect these two cases between. I think. Because I believe between two cases, we have the whole truth about mechanical support in acute myocardial infarction. One case in, is an extreme case um, in a patient with, without ROSC. So you might think I'm crazy that I'm putting an impeller in a patient without ROSC, but I'm not. And the other case is a normal heart attack case. Su such cases, I'm sure every one of you has done a lot. And, uh, and then we will try to connect these two cases. So this extreme case, um, is a 52 years old gentleman with acute chest pain. Um, he called the paramedics, he is from Lucerne, so it, he's in the city, the paramedics were there very quickly, after uh, 10 minutes, um, they recorded an ECG, and it was a, I think it was a Friday evening, and I was at home and I received this ECG on, the, on my uh, phone, and then I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm driving in. Um, I need about 20 minutes to drive in from, from my home, um, and when I arrived in the hospital, they said the patient is, is I, I was uh, surprised that he's not on the table. I said, where is the patient? They said, well, they are going to so the so-called, in German we call the Schockraum, which means the place where you assess and speak. And I said, no, 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 no Schockraum. He needs to go to the cath lab because he has a STEMI. And I think this is an important uh, point um, in our daily life to really avoid delay. So I, I, um, I took the patient to the cath lab. And then the paramedics told me that actually the patient had a therapy-resistant ventricular fibrillation. They tried to shock him t uh, 10 times. They could not succeed. So they put him on autopulse to, uh, on this mechanical um, uh, support, um, basically um, uh, doing CPR, and, and tr transferred the patient p while pumping um, in, the, in, the, um, in the ambulance. So on arrival, the patient was already 20 minutes on, uh, on um, CPR. This is how we started, and you see the time uh, there, it's 9.52, and um, I did one thing which I shouldn't have done because I knew it's a STEMI, so I should not have taken this angio at all, but I did it because somehow I wanted to be sure it's really, uh, what, it's really what it was. Um, and then the next thing I did was said, okay, well, I, of course, the normal reaction here would be to call for an ECMO. And then you will have the ECMO and they will, you will have the delay and the patient eventually will die maybe in the ICU six hours later. But in this case, I said, well, I don't have the time for the ECMO. I think I know he has a problem, a blocked LED, and let's, I'm, I'm still early. It's 20 minutes and now 23, four minutes. So let's just put an impeller. So I put an impeller. And he, of course, now you will have people who say, use ultrasound guidance. Well, that's nice in your scenario, but I don't believe that in a, such a situation you have the time and the guts to unpack the ultrasound, to cover it with the sterile thing, to look at it and then puncture under and this. It's useless, so don't do it. I believe that you should just puncture the artery because you want to save this patient. You don't want dead patients, you want live patients. And then the next thing is, of course, it's lovely to use single access in such a patient because you can you have the impeller in place and then you can put the um, the sheath inside and then just just start working. So I put then a, a, a catheter and you can see it's it's not a relaxing environment to put a wire down the LED, but it's a STEMI. It's not a CTO you have to open. So eventually your wire will get into the distal part of the vessel. Then. Um, also, the next thing is, in such patients, you, don't, you won't go for, for uh, small balloons and then a bigger balloon, and then you have to just put a stand because you want to push the thrombus aside. And maybe here I can open uh, some brackets. In our, in our center, we bring a lot of patients back to our cath lab for stent optimization after STEMI. So we do the initial procedure um, by most of the time by implanting directly a stent and then we don't we hardly do post dilatation in such patients we usually bring the patient back for OCD guided optimization and we will publish this very uh, very soon and I think this is important because you don't the last thing you want is provoking a no reflow here and if you have a no reflow then then he really won't survive so I then eventually had TM3 flow. You see, I started at 9.52, at 20, uh, 22.20, so it's 38 minutes later. Um, um, 20, sorry, 28 minutes later, we have um, ROSC and an open LED. Now, 
So before arrival, he was 20 minutes uh, and then 28 minutes in the cath lab. So it's a total of 48 minutes this patient was on mechanical, you know, on CPR. And you see his ventricle. Of course, he has some damage in the apex, but this man is alive. So three years later, the patient is doing extremely well. His ejection fraction has improved to 54%. Abbott actually uh, made a movie out of him. You can find him on YouTube by just uh, typing Impella and Tsutsuli, as a Kukuli, uh, and then you will, you will find this incredible story and you will see him driving a, a, a Harley and, uh, and playing tennis. Uh, and he does 20 watts on the bicycle exercise testing. He has no heart failure symptoms, and most importantly, in these three years, he had no rehospitalization, he has no ICD, and this man has basically a normal um, um, quality of life. Now, in this case, the lesson I drew is Impella save, CP saved his life, but also his heart. Because if we just save lives, we have only done half of the job. We have to save hearts. Because we don't, this, we don't want these patients to be back constantly in the hospital with heart failure. And I think this is probably a good approach to do this. And, uh, and I think if it worked in, in such extreme circumstances, maybe it could also work in other patients. Because this is an extreme case. I'm aware of that. But we see very much scarred ventricles um, uh, very frequently in our daily life. So this is a normal case case you have seen in your daily life. This is a 53-year-old gentleman, almost as old as the other one, with acute chest pain. He, again, um, paramedics arrive after 10 minutes. Um, he has anterior STEMI, same ECG changes. Um, the pain to balloon time in this case is, uh, is 30 minutes, so very, very quickly. He has no complication during PCI, so no, no reflow in our hospital. We have really, by, by staging the optimization of the standing, we have completely eliminated no reflow. We, it, it's something we don't see anymore. Um, and still, LVDP is 32, and he has a normal systemic blood pressure. And he won't receive mechanical support, because by all means, nowadays, you won't support such patients. In our hospital, we have actually moved a bit further down the line. We have, we discuss it very frequently with my colleagues. Uh, I, I see uh, Dr. Attinger and Dr. Bossart in the audience. So we discuss very frequently, should we put this patient on mechanical support? And this does not include only those patients who are in pure cardiogenic shock, but it's, we have widened this indication, especially for anterior MI, even before the STEMI DTU trial was designed. Because I believe that we have to do more than we are doing currently. Because what I can do in STEM is I can bring the patient quickly to the lab. This patient was quick in the lab. I can avoid complications during PCI. So please don't use a lot of contrast. Be quick. Open the vessel. Don't create no reflow. Then you have done your job. And then the third thing is probably do something about mechanics because this patient end up having a, a big scar in the ventricle. So this part, we, we, are tr we have started to elaborate. So the stem dtu is a great trial because it will answer exactly this question. It won't answer the question of the first patient because that patient probably, even nowadays, we have to put him on mechanical support very early in the course. And I think in the first place, mechanical support in MI patients, it should be Impella and then maybe escalate to ECMO. That's my opinion and, I, and we can discuss this. But I think this is now about another fraction of patients, not for the non-STEMI with, with, uh, with a simple lesion and a normal ejection fraction, but for the, for the big STEMI patients uh, with, with proximal LED who have not yet deteriorated, this might be a good thing. So the STEMI DTU will do exactly this, randomize this, this patient which don't go into qualify into shock with anterior MI and, and not the easy patients which, which don't need, who needs just, just reoscarization. So how was the outcome in this patient? You can see uh, um, the result at the end was okay. Um, we did it in the, with, with the same thing. But look at this. This is now a later angio. He then, he, this patient then underwent uh, door plastic, so he underwent um, aneurysmectomy of that apex, he received ICD, so he had, for example, because he received an ICD, he was a bus driver in Lucerne, so he could not drive bus anymore, so we took his profession away. We made, we created uh, from a normal uh, uh, working uh, person an invalid, because that was his only job, he had been driving for 25 years, and now uh, at 53, 54, with a big anterior MI, what can he do? So he's now, of course, he's not employed anymore, he's paid by our social system, which is fine, but, but, but maybe we could have avoided it. So, if you compare these two patients, patient one had an extremely bad start. 
His, open, his LED was open while 28 minutes unloaded. He was on mechanical support for four days. He didn't receive catecholamines because you could reduce catecholamines in the cath lab in that first patient. And patient uh, two was, he presented early. Um, his ep opened LED um, without no reflow. However, his LVDB was elevated but he was not in shock, that's why he did not receive mechanical support, and he needed mild doses of catecholamines at day one post-MI. So these are the two extremes of the patient. Now, we know that, I mean, and this is really something very important, and, and that's why intensive care plays an important role. I think if, patient if you start patients on catecholamines, you are already working on their, on their uh, uh, bad luck, because this, this patient with MI, where you need catecholamines, they won't do well. They will end up having scarred ventricles. And if you don't believe it, check them after six months, call them in into your clinic and look at that ventricle. You will find out that this ventricle is scarred. Because once you start them, you, you will, uh, he, their outcome will deteriorate. So if I can summarize, what do we do with mechanical support in, M in AMI? We have a systolic and a diastolic dysfunction. We have a cardiac output which is decreased. We have a blood pressure which is going down. We have an LVDP with an, with a, uh, which is increasing, with increasing LV wall stress. And we have, of course, pulmonary congestion and hypoxemia. So this all plays into more vasoconstriction, more tachycardia, more uh, less coronary perfusion. And of course, you will have worsening ischemia and, and cardiogenic shock. Imagine if your blood pressure is 80 to 50, and your blood pressure in the ventricle is 35, then you only have a delta of 15 for your coronaries. That's why your, your ST is, does not, uh, do not, uh, you don't have ST resolution, because you don't have a perfusion pressure for such patients. Now, with Impella in place, you increase cardiac output, you will increase slightly your blood pressure. I'd like, I know Abiyomet doesn't want to hear this, but sometimes I even like to use an IBP in order to increase diastolic pressure, so increase uh, diastolic perfusion for the coronary arteries. I do this from time to time, um, but and you will have decreasing LVDP and you will have less pulmonary congestion, so less ischemia, better myocardial function, and of course, patients will end up less in cardiogenic shock. So, um, we have our experience, which is now um, summarized with, with one year data, 67 patients, this is just a brief, this is the first time we are presenting this, and what we see, if you look at the LVDD, the ejection fraction improves. Okay, we expect that. But what's more important, these are shock patients. So patients with shock and pre-shock, anterior MI. And as you can see, that they do not negatively remodel. You would expect an anterior MI to negatively remodel, but they don't. So we are doing something well. These are all, all supported patients with LV unloading. So there is more into this. We have to really elaborate the data, call, maybe collaborate with other centers, but it's important to realize that by unloading these patients in shock and pre-shock, we are doing something well. And maybe we have to extend this into more patients instead of using in less patients. So in order to conclude, I think reperfusion injury is a very complex process and not entirely understood. Uh, Javier has published a lot on this, on this topic. Um, and I think left ventricular unloading plays an important role in this LV recovery. So we have to, you, we have to dig more into that. And I believe that stem d 2 will exactly help to understand if and which patients we should routinely unload before we reperfuse them. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Florim. I'm sure that we will have some, some comments from the colleagues, but Something that um, I would like to highlight, and, and that is very important to what uh, Florin has uh, shown, is that in the first case, he did not rush to open the artery. He first implanted the impella, and then he opened the artery. And this sequence, which may sound uh, counterintuitive to many, because it believes, well, I, I, let's first open the artery, and then we place the impella, is because, and, and I'm sure that you have had these cases, when you open uh, a totally occluded vessel in a patient with shock, what happens next in many occasions is that the patient crashes down, uh, goes into hemodynamic crash. So um, I think that that's, uh, that's, that's the reason why I, I believe you insisted so much in, in preventing reperfusion injury. If you want to re prevent reperfusion injury, the sooner you are um, downloading the ventricle, the better, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's this, this naive hope that 
that open archer will convert into more inotropy, which is not true. It will, you will have reperfusion injury and you will have probably for a moment less inotropy and you will need then catecholamines and then you make things, you start making things worse. So, so if, if there's one lesson one can learn, if you think of the impella, uh, use it and use it in the first place before you open the archery. Now, of course, these were large myocardial infarctions, but uh, the second case is very illustrative because we have to remember that uh, about 30% of the patients with MI were to open the artery uh, from an angiographic perspective in a satisfactory manner. They will develop what is called microvascular obstruction in MRI, which is actually a major determinant of, 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 of dead and, and heart failure uh, starting three years down the line. So it is, um, it is, I think that obviously this, we need studies, I believe. We need to really secure all this knowledge. But potentially, the idea of downloading the brain tickle in this situation to decompress, because now we understand that it is much more important to prevent, uh, to, to, to decompress the ventricle, to avoid compression, than actually protecting the shower of thrombi. The total study, the taste study demonstrated that you know, even if you try to prevent embolization with, uh, with uh, uh, thrombus manual aspiration, you will not translate into benefits. But compression seems to be a major, major problem. And perhaps you can elaborate. I, 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 I understand that there are studies comparing the effect on the myocardium in this um, acute myocardial infarction situation of, um, of uh, impella compared with ECMO. And that apparently you do not have the same type of effect, effect on the myocardium. Are you aware of this type of work or not? Um, Impella, ECMO does not have, ECMO does not decompress the ventricle, does it? Yes, I mean, this is very important to understand that, that with ECMO you will, you will work against your left ventricles. You, you, and this will lead into that um, scenario that you will save the patient but maybe not save the heart. Because in the time when the ventricle is mostly injured and when it really needs, needs help, you work against the ventricle. You won't be able, um, a, a, a shocked ventricle will not be able to open the, uh, the aortic valve properly because you will work, you will increase your, your afterload. So I think probably, and, and this is what we do in, in our center, we don't really have a, so we can, we can use ECMO, but we have to transfer the patient with ECMO from our hospital away because we don't keep them in our hospital. Um, the ECMO, they would usually go to, uh, to Zurich or to Bern. So that's why we have perf perfection, we have, we have created the perfect pathway to, to use Impella in such patients. And in our lab, it only takes five minutes to use Impella. So we don't really have a lot of experience of ECMO first because we never do ECMO first. We always do Impella first and then we can escalate to, to ECMO. However, I have to say that I cannot remember the last patient who came with ROSC where we had to escalate from Impella to ECMO. So this happens very rarely. So I think our experience demonstrates that in our, in our circumstances, and if you use routinely Impella first, you, you rarely will end up um, using an ECMO. We have a comment from, from one of the colleagues, please. Hi, uh, Bas Panulas from uh, UK. Excellent presentation, Florim, fantastic, and great spectrum. Just a couple of uh, comments. I don't know, does that work? Yeah. Um, first of all, I don't think the audience should get out of here thinking that ECMO is a bad idea for arrested people. I think we have now two trials, the Prague and the arrest, that concluded that probably there's a benefit in eCPR with ECMO. But there is one logistic that you very nicely highlighted. There's very few centers, and in my center that we're very geared up, we have a shock call, we get the team in before the patient arrives, there's no any. The door to ECMO that I have achieved with perfect punctures, with everything ready, is 12 minutes. That's because you're ramming up two big pipes, then you have to do the connections, you have to make sure fluid with fluid. So all this stuff takes time, and it will be 12 minutes. And if your center is not geared up to do that, and of course afterwards you will need to decompress the ventricle, because as you very nicely stated, the afterload with ECMO goes up, so you're not protecting the ventricle. So often you will need an impella or a balloon pump if already the LVDP is coming down. The impella, as you said, I had three cases that rosked purely with impella. And if you have it available in your cath labs, you should use it straight away. Because as you said, A, you might get ROSC straight away, but the most important thing is it buys you time. If you need to escalate to something higher, that is ECMO, you can always do that later on. The only bit I will disagree is the access. I always use ultrasound guided access, even in these situations. I think if your cath lab is geared for it and you're ready, there's nothing better than knowing where you're going in the arrest situation because you have no pulse. 
So we, I always, always use ultrasound guided access, even in uh, Lucas situations, because that you know takes you out of jail. Um, it can be done, obviously, it depends on the experience of people, um, and I agree with you on that, but uh, I think it's an important point. Thank you. That's very, very, very interesting and, and, and valuable comments. Uh, do you agree with all, the, all these? Any, any additional comments, uh, Norman? Yeah, I think as a topic about um, ECMELA concept to combine ECMO with the impeller, um, there are some data out coming from observational studies showing that unloading of the left ventricle improves outcome in those patients, and that's why uh, randomized control trials uh, on the way to um, examine this uh, concept in cardiogenic shock patients comparing ECMO versus ECMELA. Um, and we can look forward to see those data because in the end um, we have seen better outcomes and we have, uh, have the feeling that there is a better outcome for the patients, but the randomized control trial will tell us the truth about it. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. So, thank you. that uh, percutaneous mechanical circulatory support is, is a very valuable a key element in performing PCI in chip patients. Uh, I think that we, we learned that with the uh, excellent presentation by Norman. Preclinical studies suggest that percutaneous mechanical circulatory support may reduce myocardial infarction in the context of STEMI, and upcoming clinical studies may clarify whether ischemic reperfusion injury in STEMI is ameliorated by ventricular unloading with mechanical circulatory support, resulting in a smaller MI size. With this, uh, I thank you very much for your attention, for being here, and for all your comments. And I wish you a very nice course. Thank you. Thank you.